we can kind of scale back and talk big picture why it's good to get athletes off the carbs and, and become better fat burners. So there's a couple big reasons. We store a lot more calories in fat than we do in sugar. And that means that we can go for longer between meals without getting hungry. So let's say you're playing basketball and you play about 20 minutes, you're a six foot six guy. I calculated this, you're gonna burn about 600 calories in that 20 minutes of playing time wow, with all the downtime lot. and everything. Um, yeah, and so if you're only able to store somewhere around 600 to 1,000 calories of energy that would be released as sugar in the glycogen of the muscle, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel by those 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's much better if you can burn fat as much as you can. Right. Right. And so the concern that the dietitians bring up is that, well, uh, basketball and a lot of other sports are high intensity sports so you're using glycolytic fibers which are fibers that burn primarily sugar and that's true you definitely do burn more sugar in some sports than others but the more you train your body to burn sugar the more it will cooperate mm. by burning sugar and not burning fat and then that means that you don't have the enzymes in place and you just can't burn fat efficiently so that ultimately you're going to have problems with your performance because you're going to be dependent on continuous sugar infusions. And that is literally what the sports nutritionists would have the athletes do. They say you've got to have a certain amount of carb before the game, you've got to have it during the game, and you've got to have it after the game. If you're distracted by, okay, now I need this much sugar and I need this much protein, and you're, you're not paying attention to the game. Hey friends, it's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks for tuning back in to another episode. Today we're live with Dr. Kate Shanahan. We're gonna talk about her new book, Deep Nutrition. And uh, in short, we're gonna take a deep dive into uh, evolutionary biology, epigenetics, and how nutrition can influence genetic expression, and talk about the four dietary foundations found throughout the world. So Dr. Kate, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for coming over. Awesome. It's, it's great, great to, to have be. you here. Absolutely. <laughs> Beautiful home. Folks can't see the backdrop, but it's absolutely stunning. Out. And I think a great place to launch, Dr. Kate, would be kind of talking about your involvement with the Lakers. I know a lot of people are very interested in like sports nutrition and kind of, you know, we heard that like LeBron James went on a paleo ketogenic style diet. So how, kind of how did that come about and what sort of changes did you implement in these athletes uh, dietary program? So I'll answer the second question first. What do sure. we do? Um, what we did was we tried to get them to take advantage of some of the things that are essentially culinary principles that people have used for thousands of generations to, to, to get healthy that most Americans don't take advantage of and certainly athletes um, typically don't have model diets because right. Right? there a lot of them are 18 year olds that don't you know get exposed to a great diversity of vegetables for example mm -hmm. growing up. So I worked with a couple that didn't know celery versus broccoli. Wow. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and what we did was we helped them understand that you could improve your diet and it could also be delicious. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what um, Gary Beatty, who was the, um, he's kind of a legend in the NBA. He, he was the trainer at the time. He just retired last year after I think 32 years. Wow. Um, but he's a real foodie. And um, the reason our book appealed to him was that um, we were not trying to do anything like, you know, cutting edge or exciting. Yeah. <laughs> we were trying to be funny, Daddy, because when it comes to biology and food, that's what's worked is the fuddy duddy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, not so much uh, processing and all this newfangled ideas that we've been doing. So what um, they actually read our book. So when I say they, there was um, Gary Vitti and then he had an assistant, Tim DeFrancesco, who um, was from Vermont. So that therefore mm -hmm. means, in my mind, that he's genetically prone to um, wanting to get back to traditional ways of doing things, right? Everybody in Vermont, if um, you're not aware of the stereotype, mm -hmm. grows up barefoot and uh, basically drinking cow's milk directly from the cow. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Tim, Ed, probably you didn't do that. It's probably not an image you want. Right. Um, so he was kind of thinking in the direction of getting away from sports nutrition advice, which is the most backward nutrition advice that we have mm -hmm. ever come up with because we're recommending 
lots of processed food in the form of, you know, don't even eat animal protein, eat protein powder, or whey protein powder. Um, they, they get it all wrong with good fats and bad fats, and then they encourage sugar as the yeah. perfect fuel for athletes. In fact, I have an email from a sports nutritionist saying, we don't want the athletes to get too much fat because that's the wrong fuel for athletes. Mm. And so Tim was un, you know, a, a very aware of a lot of the research that's come out seeing, no, first of all, sports nutritionists are dietitians and dietitians are bound by their education to Coke because they're actually funded by Coke. I mean, it's a lot of the right. di their continuing education is provided literally by Coke, people mm -hmm. who are employees. So um, that's why they're so backwards. And so he knew that there was a need for a change and that's, uh, they were looking for something that would be tasty. Right. And so that's what they got. Right. Because the chef that they had, the facility, she, we were very lucky. Um, she actually grew up in a very traditional uh, household where mom was always in the kitchen and she was right there. So she was learning from a little girl, just the way people always did, uh, how to cook and how to make food taste good and how to figure out who would like what. And she really works magic with the players because um, not anybody could kind of push the envelope of their culinary experiences the way she does. I and mean, she has some of them eating curry and that's wow. huge for, for folks that would, you know, just as well have peanut butter and jelly every single day and in and out burger for breakfast. Yeah, pretty <laughs> fantastic. Now, um, to go back to what the athletes were doing and the kind of your rationale as to why you wanted them to burn fat better, we were talking offline, like you don't really care if people are in ketosis or not, as long as they're burning fat and kind of why is that important for you know, preventing disease and optimizing our metabolism, if we can kind of scale back and talk big picture, why it's good to get athletes off the carbs and, and become better fat burners. So there's a couple big reasons. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we should go over like three of them. So the first is that sugar is um, toxic and the body knows this. Uh, so we have all these hormones that try mm -hmm. to regulate blood sugar. And so that when you load your body with tons of sugar, you are asking your, your body's hormones to do all this extra work, whether it comes from carb or from uh, monosaccharides, sweet tasting foods. Mm -hmm. By the time it gets in your bloodstream, it's sugar. And so your body has to release insulin and then there's counter regulatory hormones like glucagon and then counter counter regulatory hormones and it goes on. And so doing that meal after meal seems to wear out your hormone system so that it becomes less sensitive and you get what's called insulin resistance over time. And so there's tons of older athletes who can understand why their lipoprotein levels are not good. They're eating the same way as they were before mm -hmm. and they're still doing a good amount of exercise, but they're starting to gain more weight. And this is just because too much carb wears out your hormone systems. Um, and that's a very non-technical way of putting it, but it's true. And yeah. we do give you some more background in the book. Sure. Exactly what that that's looks like great. on the wearing out level. But um, so then another reason that we're um, wanting to get people to burn fat instead of sugar is for the simple reason is that we store a lot more calories in fat than we do in sugar. And that means that we can go for longer between meals without getting hungry. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to do whatever kind of sporting event you're trying to do, so let's say you're playing basketball and you play about 20 minutes, you're a six foot six guy, I calculated this, you're gonna burn about 600 calories in those 20 minutes of playing time wow, with all the downtime and everything. Um, yeah, and so if you're only able to store somewhere around 600 to 1,000 calories of energy that would be released as sugar in the glycogen of the muscle, you're gonna get down to, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel by those 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's much better if you can burn fat as much as you can, right? Right. And so the concern is that the dietitians bring up is that, well, uh, basketball and a lot of other sports are high intensity sports. So you're using glycolytic fibers, which are fibers that burn primarily sugar. And that's true. You definitely do burn more sugar in some sports than others. But the more you train your body to burn sugar, the more it will cooperate mm. by burning sugar and not burning fat. And then that means that you don't have the enzymes in place and you just can't burn fat efficiently so that ultimately you're going to 
have problems with your performance because you're going to be dependent on continuous sugar infusions. And that is literally what the sports nutritionists would have the athletes do. They say you've got to have a certain amount of carb before the game, you've got to have it during the game, and you've got to have it after the game. Mm. And that's, you know, if you're distracted by, okay, now you know, I need this much sugar and I need this much protein and you're, you're not paying attention to the game. Right. Um, and meanwhile, you are having these hormones go up and down because when you have a bunch of glucose, you get all different kinds of, not just the, the insulin, but you get like the uh, pleasure hormones, which are kind of making you tired. And it's just so much going on when you have this sweet buzz of sugar that if you were able to access your fat better, you wouldn't need that. Maybe you'd need some water with some electrolytes. Mm -hmm, to um, keep it going. Yeah, and then if you do ever have sugar, then it's truly a performance enhancer. It's not a necessary thing, right? Because you can use, there's, athletes are always looking for that edge. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're like, well, okay, so if I'm low carb, am I, am I losing out on the edge? Or actually, no, you're gaining the edge because then if you periodically use sugar as a performance enhancer, which, you can do some people more mm -hmm. so than others, um, then you're getting more of an edge. But really, the edge primarily comes from fat burn. And then um, the third big reason that it's important to be able to burn fat has to do with weight maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it is an issue with athletes that they always want their body composition to their fat down into those single digits, right? Yeah. Um, just like the rest of us, <laughs> it can't be too thin or too rich. Yeah. Um, so the more you're able to burn fat, the more your appetite is naturally regulated. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that ketogenic diets are so popular is that it is, it is if you're burning, if you've got ketones, you're almost definitely burning fat and it helps you not be hungry. So it's just an easier way than to make sure you're not overdoing it with calories, which do also matter, but they're kind of secondary to the hormone effects and the appetite effects and all the other more complicated things that we're just learning about. Yeah, lovely. So, so basically to kind of summarize that, if we rely on glycolytic or glucose metabolism, there's not enough fuel in the tank for a long period of exercise. So you're dependent upon always taking all this stuff. And then there's all these counter-regulatory hormones that are ebbing and flowing, causing you know premature aging and cellular damage and all that stuff behind the scenes. So it's, it's just more efficient to start becoming fat adapted, really, essentially. And, and for some people, that can take a little bit of time, but you worked with the athletes. And did, was there any small performance drop? Is there a kind of becoming more fat, fat adapted? Or did people just, the athletes just, hit the ground running and, and didn't really notice a shift in there. Yeah, so some of the guys that went like, uh, th th there can be a performance drop if you go really quickly from one extreme to the other, mm -hmm. which we don't recommend, but some people it just can't pull them back, right? right? And so, but they, they said that, they said, you know, ah, I noticed that, but it was like only for a few days, yeah. right? And it, you know, it was preseason, so. <laughs> you got enough time to kind of space it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that by the time the season starts, they get the benefits of awesome. being a better fat burner. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really fantastic. And what I've noticed personally is you're more efficient anyway when you're burning fat for fuel. I've noticed like, you know, doing backcountry skiing and cycling and stuff like that, you, you just feel like there's a, a less winded, less gassed. I don't know how to explain it. Recovery is a little bit better. I think that baseline level of inflammation tends to be lower. I've had a friend, Alessandro Freddi, who kind of measures heart rate variability and all that. And he introduced that idea to me, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're a sugar burner, you've got all these other factors that are there that are driving your heart rate up or down, mm -hmm. independent of what you're actually doing in your, your exercise needs. Wow. Um, and then um, another thing is that one of the great things about the human body, um, we talk a lot about burning fat and burning sugar, but there's also this other kind of like the immediate thing, which now I'm gonna forget the name, I think it's like phosphocreatine, mm -hmm. uh, which is why athletes supplement with creatine. Um, but that's supposed to provide 15 seconds of energy without any oxygen. And so a good fat burner can can go from sitting to, to running really fast um, and transition from the phosphocreatine right into fat burning and never need sugar. Right. So normally, if you're not if you're not a good fat burner, I, I did some testing in my office here that I've just recently um, disassembled. But I was testing people's ability to burn fat, and I noticed that as they start the exercise, they are crummy at it. But as they 
get into it more, they warm up their body, they become better fat burners. You can watch it improve a little bit, maybe like you know, 10% for the same degree of exercise. And what that is coming from is the blood flow mm. because that is an aerobic fuel, meaning yeah. you need oxygen right. to burn it. Whereas with sugar, you can get a little bit of energy from um, sugar without any oxygen around. So your circulatory system has to be better and has to be more responsive to be a good fat burner. And that's one of the things that you do when you train for exercise, you train your circulatory system. And so exercise in and of itself helps you burn fat. Mm. But then you can train your metabolism by not burning sugar because the body knows sugar is toxic and it's going to burn it first. Mm -hmm. If that's what you have just before your exercise, if that's what you have like laying around in your bloodstream, it's going to burn that first. And so the more sugar you eat, the more you train your body to, to look for sugar to burn first instead of fat. So you don't have that perfectly smooth transition from where you can go from sitting to running really fast without feeling any kind of a burn or lag time. I right. remember, so I was an athlete in college yeah. and high school, and I remember I always felt like, okay, I had to have like two, five minutes, and then I would feel like I got into my stride. Mm -hmm. But now that I am fat adapted and on a healthier diet, I, I don't have that. It's like, I just go, and right. there's not that pull of the lag. That warm up time that's necessary. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Um, we can kind of end this discussion, but just quickly, I, I did a lot of endurance um, bike racing, competitive bike racing in Boulder. And so um, always like pre-race and all that, everyone had that um, carbohydrate kind of restricted type, type thing. So like 20 minutes into the race, you had to have some goo and then you have a banana 40. So it's like you're structuring your whole exercise or workout or event around carbohydrates, right? And so again, once you become fat adapted, you don't even really think about it. You start to right. feel like, oh, I'm it's slowing easier. down a little bit. I'm getting hungry. I should have some food, right? Right. So it's very interesting. Um, let's transition a little bit to ancient cultures and, and talk about like meal frequency timing and, and did Weston A. Price and the research that you've done, um, did he elucidate whether people were in fat burning mode or burning sugar for fuel? No, that was totally not part of anything that I ever ran into. Yeah. yeah, he was mostly more interested in how did people relate to their environment and what was it that they did to extract the maximum amount of nutrition from their environment to get it into their bodies and what was the benefits of doing that. Yeah. And um, so he didn't really get into macronutrient breakdowns or anything like that. Sure. So what we do in deep nutrition is, is we say that um, we show you how you can follow an optimal human diet. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that for most of human history, we were following an optimal human diet. And what got us off track was cigarette smoking hmm. because in the 50s and 60s before we had these epidemics of overweight and diabetes the number one cause of heart attacks was actually cigarette smoking but that possibility kind of got passed over and we got obsessed with looking for something in our diet that was causing heart attacks and the fall guy for cigarettes and all the damage they were doing became saturated fat it just you know it became the idea, the accepted idea. Now, there wasn't really data or science to support that before it became accepted. Nevertheless, the government built it into their first dietary guidelines for Americans that they issued in 1980. And to their credit, they admitted that there wasn't any data to support this set of guidelines that they just published and invited everybody to follow. So what they were going to do was periodically evaluate what everybody was eating and figure out whether or not following the guidelines actually led to the expected health benefits. Mm -hmm. So to me, what that sounds like is very much like what um, they do with animals in lab experiments, except our national um, dietary experiment has lacked all concept of a control. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially what Weston Price was looking for is was the control. Um, so, you know, when you do, what I'm talking about with control is um, when you do an animal experiment, you have two groups of animals and you have a study diet that you want to see what is the health effects of that diet versus the control diet, which is supposed to represent what is the animal eating in the wild. Mm -hmm. You give them the two respective diets for a while, compare what is the differences in their health after a while. And here's where it kind of gets a little crazy because what no one ever talks about is, is why would there be anything that's better than what an animal eats right. in the wild. Can you imagine anything better for a horse than grass? Mm. Right. <laughs> Can you imagine we'd ever come up with an experimental diet that's better for any animal 
than what they would eat. Given and have access. been eating for years. <laughs> yeah. I can't. <laughs> I right. can't. And so, what that means, though, is that any experimental diet that's ever been created in the lab is more likely to lead to any given disease than the animal's natural diet. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where we are in America. We keep creating these new, what are essentially experimental diets. We've cut out saturated fat, we've reduced salt, we've cut out cholesterol, we've introduced more polyunsaturated fats. Um, we, we keep introducing these things and we keep finding more and more disease because we keep getting farther and farther away from what is essentially the control human diet. And that's what we want people to do, is we want people to get back to the human equivalent of a controlled diet. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you do that? Well, it turns out that there's this huge body of scientific knowledge around exactly what humans should eat to be optimally healthy, except we never called it a diet. We call it cuisine. Mm. And what doctors don't really recognize, and dietitians, um, and, and a lot of people in the health space still don't recognize is that the culinary arts represent the biggest body of scientific knowledge on what humans should eat to be healthy that was ever created or ever will be created. Wow. Because what they represent is traditional wisdom that's been passed down generation after generation and built up into a larger and larger body of knowledge and lovingly curated so that you can create the healthiest possible child for your family or your, your village or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we talk about, that you know, the chefs, really, the people who could cook, um, were the original nutritionists because they created the optimal version of a human diet that our genes now depend on. And if we don't get all that stuff, that's why we get sick. Mm -hmm. So what we did to help people most easily and accurately reproduce a traditional diet is we looked for what do they all have in common. So we didn't know if we would find something that they all had in common. I mean like all different diets all throughout the world. All different cu traditional cuisines, whether mm -hmm. you're talking the French cuisine or German or people in Alaska or people in Africa or people in Hawaii. Yeah. We were just looking for, is there anything they all did in common? And it turns out that we found four things, four essentially strategies that all these groups use mm -hmm. um, and, and that we need to replicate. Each one of these strategies um, the combined, uh, you know, each one has a particular benefit and the combined of all four of them are not just add-ons to their diet, they're, they're the some description of the diet. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into those four, the, the four pillars you're talking about yes. in the book. Yeah, exactly. Let's launch with that. Okay, so the four pillars are fresh food, fermented and sprouted foods, meat on the bone, and organ meats. Mm. And so they each have like one maximal benefits. So let me give you examples. So fresh food is like salad or even um, animal foods that are not cooked, like sushi is mm -hmm. an example. Um, and those foods, there's a lot of benefits, but like the one standout is antioxidants because it's not been cooked. And heat, mm -hmm. this first thing that goes when you cook something is the antioxidants. Right. So the next pillar is fermented and sprouted. And uh, fermented food offers probiotics and so we're all trying to figure out what are the supplements we need to take for our gut flora. Well, if you have fermented food, you're getting the, the bacteria that we got traditionally, mm -hmm. as long as you're you know, fermenting some sort of logical food. Yeah. Not, <laughs> Not Cheerios trying to prevent. Or... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. um, and sprouted it is also part of that pillar because it um, is like, working with nature mm. to make f your food more nutritious. Um, so with fermentation, you're letting nature, just good microbes come in and flourish. With sprouting, you're waking up the enzymes in the seed that break naturally break down some of the anti-nutrients in there and they convert some of the um, starch, which we don't need a lot of, into more diverse nutrients like um, vitamins, for example, and fiber, which the nutritionists love. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, um, so examples would be like uh, uh, pickles, fermented pickles, not pickled pickles that are in vinegar, but mm. from naturally fermented, and then um, sprouted grain bread or sprouted nuts or seeds. 
And then the third pillar is meat on the bone, which is sort of like mouth-wateringly delicious. That's uh, your Thanksgiving dinner, your uh, ribeye steak. Um, and what that gives you is a complete protein. So we talk a lot about the amino acids and getting the essential amino acids. There's a whole other category of nutrients that we don't get if we don't do meat cooked on the bone because when you do the meat cooked on the bone, you include the skin and the collagen tissues, like the tendons and the ligaments. And cooking those breaks down and releases some very important nutrients um, that have long complicated names like glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans and collagen hydrolysate. And each one of these has a benefit um, to the cells of our body that manufacture collagen. Hmm. Those cells are called fibroblasts. And collagen is like what holds us together, literally. Right. <laughs> if we didn't have any collagen, we would disintegrate it <laughs> and right. look like pond scum. Even bone, a lot of people don't, and I didn't know this until I got into the functional medicine industry, how much collagen is in bone and comprises that and so forth. So yes. really fascinating aspect with osteoporosis, osteopenia, and age-related you know, hip fractures and all these things. So really important point. Yes, when you're looking at somebody, you're seeing you know, all, almost all protein and a lot of that is collagen. Mm -hmm. um, and the cells that make it are fibroblasts. And the healthier your collagen is, the more you can ask from your body at any age. Um, so it, it helps for sports performance, so you can you know, lift more weight, you can jump higher, you can run farther without getting these kind of things that athletes often deal with, which is like a sore hip or a sore ankle or whatever. Right. The better your connective tissues in, are, your ligaments and tendons and stuff, the, the, they depend on your collagen. But right now, we're feeding athletes something to keep their muscle healthy and nice and big, mm -hmm. but we're not giving them the, the stuff that they need to have the healthiest possible connective tissues. So that's where, um, with the Lakers, well, they go nuts over this stuff because yeah. not only is it delicious and we let them have you know, ribs and um, chicken wings, but the chef makes bone stock out of the bones wow. that she doesn't feed them, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes she'll, she'll, get, she'll get a whole chicken and when she makes chicken breasts, she cuts it off the whole chicken and she keeps the, bones, the bones to make the chicken stock that she puts in everything she possibly can mm -hmm. all kinds of soups and stuff and they, they just love it they, they don't know what she's doing yeah. uh, they just know that it's the best food they've ever had right it tastes great yeah <laughs> that's awesome yeah and so then the last pillar is um organ meats mm. which is not the most popular among the lakers i have to admit yeah um because you know things like liver and uh, beyond liver, most Americans have no experience with the rest of the organs that people in the rest of the world eat, you know, without blinking, batting an eyelash, right? You know, uh, when I was in Hawaii, we had this soup called Filipino fish head soup, mm. and there was a fish head in there with the eyeballs and everything on it, um, and, you know, nobody batted an eyelash. Yeah, like, whatever, <laughs> it's just part of the, yeah. Yeah, and, and they'll, you know, make their, they'll make meals that include, a, a clear, obviously, liver, but also blood, mm. Um, and um, what else is popular? Kidneys. Heart. Yeah, so yeah. all these things are, um, you know, muscle again is great, it's got a lot of protein, mm. but these other organs concentrate, they have different nutrient profiles. So just like we talk about eating a rainbow of vegetables, because each vegetable has different benefits, different vitamins, different antioxidants, each different organ in an animal's body is the same way. It's gonna tend to store different um, nutrients. So getting more of them, getting diff all different kinds, is the best way to supplement your body with all kinds of vitamins and things that people now buy in supplement form, like CoQ10 and lecithin and creatine and everything. Right. So now I realize that people aren't gonna jump right into that. And so the closest thing that people are familiar with that ha approximates the benefits of organ meats is eggs. Mm. Um, especially if they're pasture raised, which is a whole other very important aspect. So we have the four pillars, mm -hmm. and what is kind of in the background is the source. Right. We really emphasize that it should come, be organic if possible, and animal products really are better for us if the animal is humanely treated because yeah. they got their natural diet, they were healthier, they got to move around, they get sunlight. So that's a, another important aspect. Love that. You know, and speaking of the, uh, the organ meats, and because it's kind of unpopular, like you said, among some circles, I think it's gaining more popularity, but I have mm -hmm. this bone broth video on YouTube. It's got like, I don't know, 
quite a few views on it, but it, I use fish heads as part of it. And so many people comment like, you had me until you put the fish heads in, you know? And so it's one of these things like <laughs> people have this stigma against and it's like, it doesn't taste bad. You would never know. I mean, just it's like close your eyes. It's good because really the good. fish heads have all this fat in there. That, yeah. that, uh, well, depending what what you Salmon, use. Yeah. yeah, but there's a lot of fat in there and it has a lot of flavor. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think it would be good, but that's partly because I was addicted to sugar, right? So mm -hmm. if you have... A uh, sweet tooth, you really probably won't be able to enjoy this stuff. And you know, I, I recommend treating the sweet tooth before you want to expand your diet that much. I don't know if you'll really like it. Unless, I would love to. Let's talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> we, offline we're talking about breakfast, and if you start mm -hmm. your day with a sugary breakfast, that's going to affect cortisol and all these things, and really set the, a negative tone. Is that part of curing the sweet tooth? Is cutting out? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The most important meal of the day not to screw up is breakfast. Yeah. And when we give kids sugary cereal, when we have like a Starbucks sugar blast of Chino, mm -hmm. <laughs> we are setting our taste buds to really desire sweet because it turns out that our cortisol levels are highest in the morning. And one of the many things that cortisol does for us is it forms habits. It, it, it is... Um, uh, for, in terms of what it does for the appetite center of the brain, it makes you crave whatever was around when there was a good amount of cortisol. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it is, but it's fun to speculate that. Like, yeah. say, let's say you just killed something, right? You've got all this cortisol flushing, whatever you just, it, like when you're carnivores, pure carnivores, um, that whatever you just killed, now you're going to, you know, gobble it down. And nature wants you to enjoy that experience so you'll get out off your lazy butt and do that again. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, we have so many of these hormones that are helping us really just guide us to food and motivate us to go get food that now work against us in the context of this overly sugary environment with all these bad fats that promote inflammation in the appetite centers of the brain. Wow. Yeah, and uh, bad fats is something you talk a lot about in the book and refined seed oils and so forth. And um, I mean, we know about like omega-3 to omega-6 ratios and trans fats, but why are these seed oils, like what's the big deal with them? Yeah, great question. So for one thing, if we, if we, let's say we don't even get into seed oil versus other, you know, the chemistry of it, mm -hmm. let's just look at how much we're eating now compared to how much we were eating 100 years ago. And if you take one of the six major seed oils, soy oil, look at how much of that we got in 1909, it was about like, I think it was something like a third of an ounce a year. Wow. And now we're getting somewhere around 22 pounds. The average human is consuming that much. Yeah. Wow. So it's gone up over a thousand times, a thousand times. So whatever this stuff is, it darn well better be really good for us because we're getting a lot more of it than we used to. Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out that it's in the amounts that we consume, it is absolutely toxic. And I know that word toxic gets thrown out a lot, mm -hmm. but this stuff actually breaks down into some of the worst toxins that we've ever discovered. Um, like They also have long names like 4-hydroxynonanol and 4-hydroxyhexanol. Um, some of these compounds are so toxic that they're toxic to cells, they're also capable of mutating DNA, and they're so toxic to cells that they would kill cells so readily they didn't realize, they didn't have time to recognize that they were also damaging the DNA. Wow. Now we're eating these things, and here's the, the really tragic part. People need to know this. They need to understand what's happening. We're eating these, these compounds in this massive quantity that they're toxic because they break down this way. They're toxic because they react with oxygen. It has to do with the chemistry, and we do explain all that. Um, but the, the take home message is that they break down into these toxins that damage our genes. And we now know that a lot of diseases that we thought were, you know, we didn't understand the cause, are due to mutations that the children getting them have that their parents didn't have. Mm. And that's true for autism more than any other disease I've run across. So they think now up to 45% of autism is caused by these new mutations wow. that um, parents didn't have. So it's not like you have like an unlucky set of genes combining mm -hmm. to create a child with autism. It's that you have 
parents eating unfortunate diets and the DNA in the sperm or egg actually gets mutated as it's sitting in there before conception. Scary. So the child really doesn't stand a chance. And so they found that, you know, there's always been this certain mutation rate, they call it genetic drift. And they think it's maybe like one mutation per generation. Um, but children with autism have 10 times the number of mutations in their genes um, than this background rate. Wow. So, you know, there's this whole movement, I'm sure a lot of uh, you've run into it, like people saying, okay, well, vac vaccines, we never had autism before, we never had vaccines before. Right. But we're, if we're seeing it, what that, what that community did that was very important was make us start looking at something in the environment that was causing autism. Now, we've been looking at all these things that, uh, that get into our bodies in trace amounts, like um, glyphosate um, from Roundup, um, contaminated water bottles, mm. what is that stuff, the BPA? Is BPA and so yeah, forth. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Those are of definite concern, mm -hmm. but we have them in quantities that are minute, you know, less than 1% of our calories, less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of our calories. Um, compared to the vegetable oils, the seed oils that we have in somewhere between 25 and 45 or more percent of our calories. Crazy. So there, it's very important to pay attention to what those things do. Absolutely. So basically what, what we're saying is the concentrations of the seed oils are at such a level that they're causing like diet-induced DNA damage. Yes. And that is causing mutations in children. So it's, it's above and beyond because this is really, I didn't know this, you know, going into the kind of this discussion with you. We've heard about like the transgenerational epigenetic effects. So nutritional deficiencies in the parents lead to uh, aberrations in gene expression in the offspring. But we're talking about something totally different. So we're adding like insult injury, right? Because injury would kind of be, or however you want, whatever you want to make yeah. the injury, right? The <laughs> DNA damage or the transgenerational epigenetic effects. So it's a double whammy. You know, so parents really need, or future parents need to really understand this, this notion. Really yes. Big. It is so important that, it, you know, I, I feel like if you could just do one thing as an expectant mother um, or father, mm -hmm. because it happens to men too, it, the older men have more mutations in their DNA, right. in their um, sperm cells, I mean. Um, and um, if you could just do one thing, this would be it. Because it, first of all, getting rid of these things will get you off of most of the crappy food anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and. I think it's every bit as important, if not more important, than quitting smoking or not drinking alcohol while you're pregnant. Wow. But it's also something that men need to think about too. Yeah. Because it affects the quality of their sperm. Very important. You know, I think men have been let off, we caught up with an epigeneticist recently, Lucy Aronica. She was episode number 169, I think. But um, we talked about how, you know, the onus has been placed on women, like, oh, moms, you need to eat well. But we yeah. now know that, that men, uh, you know, there's epigenetic marks that are inherited or, or um, transmitted via the, the paternal route. So it's very important for men. Yeah, well, we actually have, you know, research now because we've, mm -hmm. there's been such advances in genetics. We can do these genome-wide association studies. And so mm -hmm. it's really taught us, we've finally been able to make some progress in understanding what's going on with autism. Um, but so, yes, uh, they actually found that more so in men than women are they finding the sperm compared to the egg have more mutations. And so that's why one of the strongest associations is that um, the, with autism is that older men have a much higher risk of autism than of, of a child ha having autism mm -hmm. than a younger man. And it's because of the accumulated damage that, you know, the sperm are reproducing something like every 28 days, right? Mm -hmm. Women are born with all the eggs that they're going to ever use. Right. So they just have to, you know, not be blasted with radiation. Or <laughs> sure, sure. But guys have to behave every single day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what we say, it's kind of like if you, you, you want to think of it this way, like, you, let's say uh, it's your 21st birthday, you go to McDonald's and load up on fries, deep fried fries, which are the worst source of those toxic oils. You're walking out of that restaurant having aged your gonads proportionally far more than, you know, just the amount of time you were in there. Wow. So it's, you're accelerating the aging process. Very scary things. stuff. Now, why is the, uh, to kind of 
carry that thought through, the, the fried oils and so forth, the fried foods in those oils. Why is that so bad? So the fried foods are, are the worst sources of toxic fats because they start out with the seed oils typically. And the seed oils are bad for the reason that they oxidize easily and degrade and break down. So heat accelerates that process. So you keep them in a fryer all day or two days or for a week, mm -hmm. which they do. And by the time you're done, it is mostly toxic. Yeah, really oxidized oils. Very, very oxidized, broken down oils. They're molecularly, you know, radically different than what they were when you poured the out of the container in the first place. And they weren't all that great because even the factory processing causes some degradation to take place so that even, you know, the best form of canola oil you can buy is still got some of this stuff in it. Mm -hmm. um, we were never meant to be using these oils the way we are. We were meant, the, the, the thing about them is that they're, the chemistry of them is that they are polyunsaturated fats. So we talked about saturated, then monounsaturated, olive oil is famous for that. Um, the seed oils have a lot of polyunsaturated fatty acids and they react quickly with oxygen. So getting them out of the seed, refining them, um, then cooking with them, breaks them down, breaks them down, breaks them down. When they get in your body, they'll react with the oxygen in your body and iron accelerates that reaction. Hmm. So in your bloodstream, they break down, they start damaging your lipoproteins and they're one of the most important things when you have cardiovascular disease. Um, if you want to reverse arterial disease, you have to get these things out of your diet. Very interesting. And so it comes back to kind of full circle. One of the pillars is the fresh vegetables, right? Fresh foods, and, and those are rich in the polyphenols and the antioxidants, which can help to mitigate that. Hugely. Yeah, really important stuff. Um, we have, we've kind of talked about epigenetics a little bit, but you notice some, some things in your clinical practice in Hawaii that I think are, are really unique that are worth sharing. And, and some of you've seen you know, grandparents to grandchildren, and you saw kind of a difference in vitality and health. And that kind of opened the door, I'm inferring from that discussion about epigenetics. You want to take a deep dive into that? Yeah, so I'm a family practice doctor, so I see all ages. And in Hawaii, um, the culture of the place was such that like it wasn't until recently that there was even electricity in every house so people were really following a very traditional way of living for a very long time and so um, the older generations that people were in their 90s are, are un unbelievably healthy like I, I would have patient after patient in their 80s who was like doing these things doing things that would get them into trouble right because they're 80 so one little old lady got ran over by her own car. Oh. And so she was in the ICU for, you know, a month, but then she comes out, she's fine. Like six months later, she crushed her knee and she's good as new. Well, wow. I mean, you know, she's 80 something, so not yeah. brand new, but yeah. <laughs> so the ability to heal was just incredible. And what I noticed though first was the structure of the face. Yeah. Um, because when you look back in the history books, um, you see all these people with these square jaws and that's one of the things that we is so ingrained in our psyche the square jaw that it's like the hero he must have a square yeah. jaw if you watch the Muppets the heroic guy had this massive jaw mm. with a divot in the middle like mm. you do <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's because there is a certain facial structure that develops when a person is exposed to optimal nutrition that allows their genes to express optimally. Yeah. So now we're not talking about the DNA, um, not just the DNA letters, but the expression of what's the potential of your genes. So you, you can take two plants and give one you know, optimal light and optimal water, it's gonna be beautiful, and the other clone basically don't treat it so well and it won't grow very well, it yeah. won't be very healthy. So what I was seeing in these families was that this, the faces were becoming more narrow. There are all different patterns that I would see. Like you could see the jaw being smaller so that the teeth didn't all fit anymore. And the kids had to get so many teeth pulled or braces for years. Um, or you could see like the mid face kind of collapsing, going back a little bit. So they would get an underbite. Um, and then like me, I have a small jaw and like my eyes didn't develop right. So hmm. the, the need for glasses is so common. We don't even recognize it as an abnormality anymore, but right. it's, it's not normal. I mean, what other animal yeah. has imperfect vision? Right. Um, and because we've accommodated for all these things, but 
Um, it has to do with the shape of the eye because the eye has to be a certain exact precise shape for the image to f the lens to be able to focus the image in the back of the eye called the retina. Hmm. And um, if you don't have that, then you need uh, some kind of you know artificial lens to get it to do that instead. And so it turns out that there is this mathematic principle that, that guides this growth to, so that you do have this square jaw and everything fits and everything functions perfectly. It's not just about looking like a hero mm -hmm. um, or not needing to wear glasses. It's, it's about function, obviously, with vision, yeah. or, or teeth being straight, also uh, with your nasal passages being wide enough so you don't get sinus infections or your ear canals being wide enough so they can drain and you don't get ear infections. I mean, it just has so many repercussions. Mm -hmm. But there's this universal principle of optimal growth that's built into the universe. So it's like, uh, this starts to sound a little foo-foo, yeah. but it's really true. It's physics. You can probably ask your neighborhood physicist mm -hmm. if he's ever heard of this, um, this ratio called phi. It's... Um, got to do with the Fibonacci sequence as well. Um, and it's a mathematic principle, like pi is a mathematic principle. And a very smart plastic surgeon um, uh, who lives in California recognized that there must be some kind of principle guiding human growth. And he discovered that there's a formula for the perfect face, that the key to it was putting phi into the formula. Hmm. And so when you get good food, you are more likely to be able to grow with that perfect formula. It also looks, you know, we call it beauty. It is, it's an emotional thing. We don't even cognitively have to think about it because nature, it's so important that yeah. nature built it into our, our emotions, which are hard to deny, <laughs> yeah, right. right? So you're, when you're attracted to somebody because of the way they look, we call it shallow, but really it's very deep because it has to do with the health of their DNA and their genetic expression. Wow. Is that how the name came about, Deep Nutrition, this principle, this phi, and so forth? Yeah, it's one of the things, because actually deep is something that um, pertains to ecology, too. Mm -hmm. And I really like the idea that we are a reflection of the health of our landscapes, of, our, of nature, of the natural world. Right. Um, because it is true that, um, not to suddenly become a, uh, an environmentalist, but if we destroy the parts of the natural world where our food is coming from, which we're kind of doing, mm -hmm. the oceans and stuff, yeah. then we're going to be changing our DNA. Wow, very scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very frightening stuff. So we, I think we covered a lot of bases. Is there anything about the book or anything on the top of mind that you wanted to discuss that we didn't really get to talk about? Um, I think that one thing I'd just like to say is that, yeah. you know, when people, people read our book and if they don't know how to cook, they can kind of feel overwhelmed and that's normal. Mm -hmm. um, it, don't do any, don't do it all at once. Nobody does that. Even right. people who can cook. Um, I've had people who say that they changed their diet over the course of three, four years, but they started with one thing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing they started with was what they thought was their worst thing. Like I hear a lot, this yeah. soda, like I stopped having soda. And the way it worked with uh, w the way it works with a bunch of people that I've heard from is that so they cut their soda, they lose weight, they feel better about them themselves, they're more motivated to cook for their families. Yeah. Then they start learning how to cook, and they start with something that they like. So you start with a change that makes sense to you, and that gives you an immediate feedback. Because mm -hmm. if you don't get that feedback, you're not going to continue. Yeah. So. If you try something, it doesn't work, try something else. Right. Those small <laughs> wins are so important yeah. to kind of like catalyze and get the snowball building and building. Exactly. Really important point. And the meat on the bone, I mean, I think I'm just thinking out loud, an easy thing to implement is like a crock pot slow cooker because totally. you just throw in ribs or whatever else or roast and yeah. you get all the collagen and all that. So that's really a, an easy thing. And you don't need to, you can just turn it on, set it and forget it, put some spices in there, bay leaves, and you're ready to rock and roll. Right. Yeah. I love those simple kind of recipes. They're kind yeah. of my favorite. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Speaking of recipes, one of the questions we ask every guest on the show, Dr. Shanahan, is your morning routine and what you do in the first couple hours every day. So we have over <laughs> 600 someone references here. I think 492 pages. You have a busy practice and you're doing a lot of great things in the world. What does your morning look like? Um, so I get up and... Um, feed the cats and start draining my coffee. Yeah. 
because I do the cold brew thing. Yeah. And and then I do some stretches because I'm old and I have to straighten out my connective tissue. Mm. <laughs> so I do some like sit ups and yoga and stuff for about 15 minutes. And then I um, take that coffee. I let the cats out. And, and I take that so they won't bother me on my computer. And yeah. then I, I take the coffee and I glob in um, like a cup and a lot of milk and it's raw milk mm -hmm. um, from pastured cows around here. And we have to go to a pet store to get it because it's illegal to sell. Oh, yeah. Um, and then a whole ton of cream, like a probably close to a quarter cup of cream. Wow. And that is what I have done every day for years. I'm totally addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, to the point, I bring it on like trips and vacations with me. So that's cool. Yeah, I have an issue with it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Is it the raw cream it. as well? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, heat destroys nutrition. So mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Now, how much milk are you putting in there? Just Probably about a cup and a half. Oh, really? Cup and three quarters. So it's pretty balanced with the protein and the, and the fat, yeah, right? It is a lot of fat. Like yeah. um, for for me, it works because it, I don't get hungry for lunch. I almost never eat lunch, mm -hmm. and that's good because I'm usually like busy. Yeah. And if I do sit down and eat lunch, I I, I have no self control, so I'll, I'll just like I won't be able to stop eating. I'll just if, if Go I'm to home. Town. Yeah. yeah. So it's easier for me to just skip it and wait till Luke makes dinner. Right. That's a nice. Yeah. You gotta <laughs> fit what works for your schedule and everything. Yeah. Right. That's really awesome. <laughs> Uh, so if you're stranded on a desert island and you can only bring one herb, nutrient, botanical, maybe a supplement, vitamin D and omega-3s are covered, what are you bringing with you? Um, I guess it's going to depend what's on the island. Can I just bring a cow? You can bring a cow, yeah. No one's <laughs> ever said that before. I love that thinking. <laughs> That's right. To eat the cow or to mostly get the cream and the milk? Um, I would do the Maasai. I would copy what the Maasai do. So yeah. they, they do the milk and they also... Um, drain the jugular periodically, and wow. that's a staple of their diet, actually. Is those so they two. drain it and then plug it back up, and let it clot. Yeah, or heals, or whatever, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. The cow's fed very healthy. They're very particular about what their cows eat. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and that's the staple of a traditional Maasai diet. That's really amazing. So where would that <laughs> fall into the four pillars? Would that be in the fresh category? or? Yep, fresh, okay. and, uh, and somewhat fermented because they actually do let it kind of sit for a day and wow. or two. And yeah, like kind of coagulate and ferment and yeah, get the probiotics in there. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's really yeah, cool. they've, I mean, they've mastered the art of cow uh, resource, yeah. the cow resource. <laughs> Have you ever personally tried that? No, okay. I would totally love to go to Africa. Right. Give it a but whirl. you know, those traditions are dying so fast because of the war and the drought. And you know, now people have told me they go to Africa and Mostly what the Maasai do is have tea and mm. lots of sugar in there. That's not uh, their traditional that diet. such a bummer. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad to hear <laughs> that when these traditions change and so forth. Having spent time in Asia, I see the same thing where it's like there's like the novelty is McDonald's and Taco Bell and Wendy's <laughs> and, and the, you know, making yeah. kimchi and sauerkraut are, is, you know, a thing of the past. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, last question here. If you were to bump shoulders with a, you know, president, maybe Donald Trump, Barack Obama, whoever, or someone from the World Health Organization, what sort of health or lifestyle tip would you want to share with them? Well, if I was going to bump into Trump, what I would tell him is that the way to make America great again, because that seems to be something he's into, mm -hmm. is through our stomachs. Love it. <laughs> Anything else? I mean, any details there? Or just well, all the economic repercussions. If we get back to kind of like more old style, for America, he said himself that America was great in the 50s. We had something like a hundred times more family farms back then. Yeah. We were great because we were fed well mm -hmm. and we were economically self-sufficient. Our families, you know, were cohesive, partly because the farming lifestyle is kind of a natural human lifestyle. You know, the kids grow up learn, learning, they have a, a mini apprenticeship from their parents and how to take care of the animals and the farm. And it's just, it's such a, we don't think about the value of growing up with your parents, respecting what they do, being self-sufficient. But that's definitely what I would tell them. Yeah, I love that. It, it, <laughs> when, when you articulate it in that way, it really makes sense that like farming and growing food is kind of like the nucleus for a healthy family too. 
right? Because it keeps families together and has more kids healthy and all that. Really amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, Dr. Kate Shanahan, thanks so much for coming on the show. You're the author of Deep Nutrition. We'll have the links uh, to the books and so forth below Great. on the description. And uh, if folks want to connect with you online, what's the best online resource for that? So I have a website, um, drkate.com, and it's drcate.com. Okay. Probably have a link for that. Today, yeah. Guess, right? We'll put that in the show notes as well. So folks, thanks so much for tuning in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And as I mentioned before, we'll have the show notes and information below in the description. So just open that up. And I appreciate you tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode.